Hello, good evening and welcome to CCI webinar. I myself, Dr. Mahavir Modi, I welcome all of you on behalf of uh, CCI for this wonderful webinar. I must first congratulate CCI for conducting these kind of webinars almost for last maybe more than three years or four years. I really don't know how many topics they have covered. And I'm really surprised that the way Dr. Krishna and the team, they're able to generate newer and newer topics and there is no repetition. So if somebody asks me to have an MD full exam question paper, still I am stuck and I'm not able to generate more than 10 questions. But how come this CCI is so brainy in conducting these webinars relentlessly mm -hmm. and absolutely they are all uh, newer topics which always give some food for thought for all of us. So I thank Dr. Krishna for initiative for taking all pulmonologists together, pan India and not only senior but even junior pulmonologists are all taken care of and they prepare their talks so well, so phenomenally. Dr. Narayana Pradeep is there, Dr. Maske is there, my friend Dr. Vijay Kumar. So thank you everyone. Without wasting much time, I will introduce my panelists for today and uh, we'll have a brief introduction about the topic what we are going to discuss today. So the talk or the topic which has been given is armamentarium in chest practice beyond stethoscope and beyond pulse oximeter. So it really made me thought, it really made me think, I was thinking again and again, how do I conduct this and how do I model it and then I came to know that it's vast and I mean, you know, we can even discuss this talk endlessly, maybe over a day also. And then somehow I discuss with my panelists and then we discuss that how we can cut it short. So we all have time constraint. I will be having maybe four or five questions to everyone. Before that, we'll have a presentation by Dr. Sridevi. So we all know that chest has evolved over a period of years and we don't see chest practice the same way we used to say maybe around even five years back. So COVID has taught us a lot of things. It has given a lot of new horizons for our chest medicine practice. And we have sub specialties in chest medicine. We have people doing only interstitial lung disease. We have people doing only asthma and airway disorders. We have people doing only pulmonary hypertension. Then there are people, those who are doing interventional pulmonology. But I think this all is quite a part of maybe only tertiary care institutes. However, if you see 80% of chest practice, what you and me, we all are doing is basically an OPD based practice or maybe a basic chest practice. So today's our aim is to know that how do one budding pulmonologist, he has what all equipments are needed, how he or she will be able to set up the practice or the chest clinic, OPD as well as sometimes the IPD setups where do we put our hands in and where do we say that, no, no, these are my boundaries. I am not supposed to cross these boundaries. So we will have those kind of discussions. What all things are required for a chest physician to label himself or herself as a successful chest physician so that people will recognize them that yes, he's a chest physician and he deserves more and more chest referrals. So how do one can build that image in the society to promote himself or herself as a chest physician? And for this, I have this wonderful panelists. I will just introduce all the panels to you. Uh, we have senior most Dr. Ajay Lanjewar. Ajay is a very good friend of mine and uh, I met him last time in Natcon in Nagpur. So that time I got first introduced to Dr. Ajay. And after that, then in few of the other conferences and of course through the CCI groups, and he is very, very academically clever. He has an inquisitive mind. He will keep on generating questions and try to solve them as well. He is a consultant pulmonologist and HOD at MJIMS Hospital, which is at Seva Gram, which is a, a superb institute. And um, definitely, um, uh, needless to say, but it has a lot of ethical practice in our uh, uh, Maharashtra as well as everywhere in India. And it has a good name for this kind of institute. Then we have Dr. Soumya, uh, Soumya Adimulapu, she is an MD, uh, she has also done IDCCM, so critical care medicine and she has also passed her European Diploma in Adult 
respiratory medicine and of course when she has so many degrees so she is attached to the best of the place and she is with the apollo health city at hyderabad so welcome dr soumya for this wonderful webinar and uh, i am sure that you are going to have a lot of uh, questions based on this uh, how do you have set up uh, goals in your practice then we have dr swadeep mishra dr swadeep ji he is a consultant in interventional pulmonologist and he is an assistant professor at department of respiratory medicine from kims hospital bhubneshwar so kims also we all know that it has multiple spread across india and uh, uh, this is a phenomenal institute to work uh, work and uh, definitely chest is uh, a part and parcel of most of the respiratory most of the allied medicine branches and uh, kims should be uh, number 1 for such kind of platform and dr uh, uh, mishra you are welcome to this wonderful uh, uh, webinar uh, then we have yes dr then dr we have dr sri devi dr sri devi she has an opening talk also and uh, uh, after my introduction she will be definitely taking over the talk she is a senior consultant pulmonologist at jerry care hospital at uh, chennai so welcome dr sri devi and then we have dr madhur joshi so dr madhur is a consultant at uh, department of respiratory diseases at he is at rajasthan and he is at rajasthan hospital as well as he has uh, his own center at uh, swasth wellness and lung center so welcome dr madhur and uh, welcome to all of you um, i won't take much of your time and we will just uh, start with dr sri devi's presentation so dr sri devi uh, please start with the At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. N. H. Krishna Sir, Founder Chairman of uh, CCI, for this opportunity. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mahavir Modi Sir, um, the moderator for uh, today's webinar. Uh, so today's topic being armamentarium needed in a pulmonologist practice beyond a stethoscope and pulse oximeter. So before going into uh, knowing what we have in store beyond, let's get back to our basics, the fundamental tool which is a good history taking. Yes, I'm going to uh, emphasize on this because this is a fundamental and the most important tool what every pulmonologist should have. So this not only helps in getting the crucial information uh, which is required for the diagnosis, but also helps to building up uh, a rapport with the patient. And I'm, I'm not going to uh, do in detail about the history taking because we're all well versed with, uh, you know, all these things. So I'm just going to rush through these slides. So, and also it's very important that we elaborate each and every cardinal respiratory symptom, uh, which is cough, sputum, breathlessness, hemoptysis, chest pain, and wheeze. Including uh, the constitutional symptoms is very important and uh, upper respiratory symptoms as well. In any patient who is suspected to have OSA, uh, including uh, symptoms of snoring and excessive daytime sleepiness should also be done. Uh, importance of uh, past history, family history, personal history, all this is so important. And also the occupational history and uh, pets travel history also should be emphasized. Drug history, this is one of the neglected areas. I think uh, we have to give a lot of importance to the drug history, uh, including all the patients present and the past medications. A general physical examination, this is the second most important tool, head-to-toe -to -toe examination of the patient, uh, which will give us a lot of information, including the vital signs, for instance, uh, clubbing, which is going to give us so much information in narrowing down the diagnosis of uh, the patient. Uh, for, uh, for instance, any patient with having like, uh, you know, clubbing, uh, we can narrow down to separative lung diseases, IPF, bronchogenic carcinoma, etc. Of course, the importance of a proper respiratory system examination uh, cannot be ignored. So it is uh, very important that we thoroughly evaluate the patient, including all the uh, components of the respiratory system examination, uh, inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation. And we should make sure that we uh, examine the upper airways of the patients as well. And other system examination also should be done. Next, what do we have in store? is the important uh, questionnaire scales and tools. Uh, this can be very useful. We can have it handy in our OPD 
and it can be handed over to the patient to just fill it in and it's going to give us valuable information. So let us look at uh, some of the very important questionnaires or the tools what we have or what we can have in our OPD. So uh, this is very simple test uh, scoring system. What we can have is a MMRC scale, which is a modified medical council research, uh, you know, research council Disney scaling uh, scale. Uh, here uh, it is a five point scale starting from zero to four and all that the patient has to uh, do is answer the question, simple questions of how, how much breathless he feels in day-to-day -day activities. And accordingly, the patient can be scored. And uh, this can give us a lot of information and can be used as a prognostic indicator as well. Six-minute walk test, it is a very simple, inexpensive tool. It can be repeated every time the patient walks in and it, it gives us a lot of uh, information, a lot of information regarding the exercise tolerance of the patient. And all that the patient has to do is... Uh, uh, he or she is instructed to walk along a corridor for six minutes and uh, the distance traveled and the saturation before and after uh, the end of at the end of six minutes is noted down. So yet another useful uh, tool, uh, especially in COPD patients is board index. B standing for body mass index O for obstruction, uh, which can be uh, evaluated by doing a P, uh, the PFT test. Dyspnea got by MMRC scale and exercise tolerance of the patient by six minute walk test. And patients are scored accordingly. And this can be very useful as a prognostic uh, prognosticating in patients with COPD. So, a CAT scoring system, which stands for COPD assessment test, which is very simple tool, easy to understand. And uh, uh, it consists of eight symptoms, which uh, most of the COPD patients will commonly have, like cough, uh, phlegm, chest pain, uh, dyspnea, uh, his exercise tolerance, sleep, etc. And all that the patient has to do is grade himself from zero to five as to how much less or how severe the symptoms are. And accordingly, the patient uh, is scored, uh, and anything uh, uh, patient is scored accordingly by calculating all these uh, numbers at the end. So uh, two important uh, scales what we have uh, for patients uh, suspected to have obstructive sleep apnea is Epworth sleepiness scale, especially in patients who have uh, increased snoring at night and uh, they have excessive daytime sleepiness. This shows the chance of patient dozing off during these various activities like sitting, reading, uh, or watching television and patient is just asked to uh, grade themselves as to how much chance they have of dozing off during these various occasions. And uh, any score more than seven uh, needs uh, you know, patient to be evaluated by a proper sleep test. So yet another scoring system which we have for patients with OSA is a stop band. It is an eight point uh, you know, uh, questionnaire. And here all that the patient uh, has to do is just answer questions like yes or no for these uh, various things and then once uh, the patient is done doing that and we calculate the risk of OSA, uh, whether it is mild, moderate or severe. So gap index, this is one of the useful index in uh, predicting the mortality of patients with ILD, especially IPF. Here G stands for gender, A for age, P physiology, that is the percentage predicted FVC value and percentage predicted diffusion capacity. So uh, uh, based on whatever the patient has scored, the number of points, they are uh, classified as having a gap stage one, stage two, or stage three. Uh, this simple questionnaire, which can be used uh, to assess how well a patient with asthma is having their symptoms under control. Uh, this has uh, four questions, uh, which can be like, you know, daytime symptoms twice a week or any night awakenings, use a need for the rescuer, uh, relieve a medication and uh, any limitation in the uh, activity. So all that the patient needs to do is just answer questions uh, like yes or no, and depending on which we will be able to uh, assess how well or how uncontrolled uh, the patient's asthma is. Uh, two important, uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, the question is for a patient having pneumonia. One is very simple, uh, which is CURB 65, it's short form. C standing for confusion, U for urea more than 7 millimoles per liter, R for respiratory rate more than 30, 
uh, B standing for blood pressure less than 90, 60 and uh, 65 is the uh, age more than 65. Uh, this uh, scoring system can give us, um, um, help us in assessing the patients with pneumonia. And also we can take uh, the help of this to know whether the patient can be admitted to the hospital or needs ICU admission or can be treated at home. It also helps in predicting a 30-day mortality in a patient with community-acquired pneumonia. Uh, this uh, scoring system, which is a pneumonia scoring index, which can be a little complicated, but uh, it is very useful for a patient who is admitted in the hospital with community-acquired pneumonia. It takes into consideration various parameters like demographic profile of the patient, comorbidities, examination findings, laboratory findings, and based on whatever the patient has scored, they're classified as having a low risk, medium risk, or high risk of uh, mortality. So after having known uh, these various uh, questionnaires, I think these are must-have tools in any OPD practice for a pulmonologist. Uh, the importance of these uh, is that like, uh, it helps us not only in uh, guiding us uh, to know the severity of the patient, uh, the uh, disease severity of the patient, but also helps in monitoring the progress of uh, the disease and also helps uh, tells us the mortality risk of uh, uh, the patient. So in addition to this, I think these investigation tools we are all well-versed with and which we've been using Chest X-ray is a must-have, a PEFR, uh, which is so very useful in asthmatic patients. PFT test, the basic spirometry is definitely must-have for a patient uh, in our uh, uh, clinical setup. And uh, sputum evaluation uh, with uh, and pheno testing also is gaining a lot of importance uh, in our practice. Ultrasound chest or you know ultrasound uh, can be used uh, to evaluate the chest diseases. And this is gaining a lot of importance, uh, you know, off late in pulmonology practice as well uh, in diagnosing uh, and also like, you know, therapeutic uh, uh, areas uh, for a pulmonologist that is going to be very useful as a point of care test as well. So I think I'm going to end my talk here to, uh, I think we'll be discussing all the various aspects of uh, this presentation again in the panel discussion in detail. So I'm going to end my talk here to enable the panel discussion. Thank you. And now, you want me to read it? <laughs> Okay, so mm -hmm. Dr. Tridhiji, wonderful presentation and uh, can I start now? Yes. Yes, sir, please start. Yes, yes. Huh? So, uh, welcome you all again and uh, thank you, Sridevi. It was very crisp and uh, because it is said that we have to never forget history because history is something which is very, very important, especially in chess practice. So, there was a uh, few years back, there was a paper in Lancet. And this paper mentioned basically that uh, how soon when the patient enters into a consultant's cabin, how soon the diagnosis is made. And there were different specialties. There was a neurology, there was cardiac, there was respiratory. And you will be amazed to get the answers. And the answer was that in 80% of the time, the consultant is able to diagnose or suspect a disease within 17 seconds okay so that was the flow and i think that is something which is very very important just based on the history plus based on the way patient approaches you the way the way patient coughs so you have very beautifully said that history is very very important in our clinical practice and although it is not an equipment or armamentarium in our clinical practice but definitely it is most important tool for all of us as a clinician but uh, only history is not going to be sufficient and we definitely need more and more uh, equipments to set up our clinical practice in respiratory medicine. So uh, first I will, maybe I'll start with Dr. Madhu. Dr. Madhu is looking very smart. So I want to start questions from Dr. Madhu. So Madhu Vajit, Madhurji, you are practicing, you have your own center plus you are working in one corporate hospital also. So how do you 
start or what all armamentarium, what all equipments are required for a chest physician to start a chest OPD practice. We have a lot of budding pulmonologists, you know, and uh, almost in a year in India, it is said that almost 300 new pulmonologists are getting added. So we have a lot of these new people and I want your guidance about this, that how uh, these are equipments are required. Uh, thank you, Dr. Modi, for your kind information. Uh, so uh, this question, when I hear, I just uh, can figure out myself uh, uh, during my UG days when we were uh, in our final year at BBS. So, you know, we used to carry so many things are in our apron uh, that I think is not possible now. <laughs> so, we, you know, our pockets were full of all the equipments that could include a tuning fork, a hammer, inch tape and everything. Uh, but now, since uh, uh, we are into a specialty practice, uh, I think uh, when I started my uh, outdoor, so the basic uh, was to have a chair, a table, a stethoscope, maybe uh, later on I added on with a pulse oximeter. But, uh, you know, there are a few important things that you have to uh, have around in your uh, outdoor so that it becomes uh, easy whenever you need to uh, examine your patient, you know, that uh, look in the eye of the patient, that touch to the patient is very important. I still uh, use my hands and my uh, watch and a second, uh, with a second's hand to feel the pulse and count the pulse rate rather than depending purely on a pulse oximeter. So uh, I used to have, uh, I also carry my torches. I have uh, now have a, a view box, which is a small view box, which can accommodate a X-ray or a CT scan. Uh, I also have a couch around my uh, OPD table and chair. You know, that couch I think is very important because it's not always that you will make a patient sit on your stool, which is always there. Uh, but you will, at times, you will have to examine the abdomen and the other systems as well. So these are a few important things which I uh, feel is the bare uh, necessity. And then, yes, maybe uh, you can have a peak flow meter or a spirometer which is easily connected. Now uh, we are entering a digital era. So in my earlier days when I started, say, five years or seven years down the lane, when I started, I used to write prescription by my hand. But even a desktop is now an important tool uh, to, you know, save your uh, uh, data. And, you know, you, you can uh, give an uh, e-prescription uh, as well. So uh, as you uh, grow, you know, earlier I used to see only five patients a day. But once you uh, step ahead, then you have to have uh, an increment in your armamentarium around you so that you can first at least clinically because even uh, there is a very uh, good line which i which we all used to uh, read in harrison's that most of the 80 to 85 percent of our diagnoses are based on our history and clinical examination only and then maybe we can go for uh, supportive investigations uh, accordingly uh, to a specific diagnosis Thank so these are a few armamentarium that i used okay. to have i have i still uh, ca uh, carry them. If not carry them, I have it there in my uh, drawers or somewhere. Even an inch tape uh, helps me a lot whenever I'm evaluating. A torch, a tongue depressor. Tongue depressor, now I have evolved to uh, use, using it to a disposable tongue depressor which are easily available next to my clinic. Very nice. I think the most important what I liked was when you said that touch. The yes. touch is something which is very, very important. Okay, and... Uh, I feel many of the times, you know, after auscultation and if you just tap your patient or just, uh, you know, rub the chest or rub the back, they feel extremely happy. They feel extremely happy. Okay. Because the way uh, they expect a lot from you and you can't do that much of time, but that one touch, it means that, you know, you are there with them and you understand what is the problem this patient, uh, person is suffering. So, thank you very much for these. All basic armamentarium is what is required in our clinical practice. And this is the basic thing, I think, that is how any budding pulmonologist should be able to start his or her uh, career. Of course, we need a spirometer to know yourself as chase physician. I think uh, we need a bronchoscope also because once you have that, 
then maybe you are more labeled as a pulmonologist. But we will go into those questions later on. Now we have Dr. Saumya from Apollo Hospital and because you mentioned about torch. So I want to know, does in Apollo Hospital see people use torch or you directly go for scopies? Hmm. So what sir, is, do we use torch? Sir, yes. Uh, so fortunately we are equipped with a torch in our phone even though Apollo is not providing us torch actually. So I will definitely use the torch to examine my patient because it is very, very important before you go for an actual respiratory system examination. First, look at the upper airway of the patient. So most of our patient comes with cough. They doesn't have any issues like SOB, fever. I mean, uh, nothing to suspect, something related to the lung issues. So usually they, they come with a cough, which is they say that it is more in the night, uh, very uh, frequent allergic rhinitis and uh, not able to sleep in the night. So before we, uh, when they say, for example, unable to sleep in the night, so maybe uh, not uh, not feeling uh, sleepy uh, I mean, in the night and they excessive daytime sleeping. And before we jump into a conclusion of uh, OSA, probably we'll better have a look at the nasal polyposis if anything is obstructing the nasal cavity. And uh, for example, uh, and anyway, oral cavity has to be exa examined for the malum party grading, how it is. So if it is a high grade, probably he is a uh, probable patient with OSA. And uh, patients with uh, using inhalers, they will be having an intractable cough in spite of having a good doses of inhaled corticosteroids uh, in uh, rotacaps, which they will be using. How much ever sometimes we insist, they won't be guarded. They won't be uh, compliant with the gargling of the mouth after taking the inhaler. So look at the oral cavity, how is the hygiene of the oral hygiene of the patient. Sometimes when they don't gargle, there will be a lot of oral candidiasis that might again result in the cough. So, uh, so examination of the nasal cavity for DNS. So the frequent allergic rhinitis in spite of the continuous non-delucost anti-allergic medication, they will be having a recurrent allergic rhinitis, probably some uh, DNS might be uh, uh, triggering that. How is the mucosa? Is it erythematous? Uh, is there any secretion? Are there any oral plates? It's really important to use the torch in our clinical practice and I definitely use it. If there is a suspicion, do not hesitate to ask the patient to remove the mask, open the mouth, uh, uh, keep your tongue out that there is no, uh, I mean, it might take some more than some one minute for us, but that gives a lot of information when you use the touch and when you examine the upper airway. Yeah, I I, that I insist on using the uh, touch while examining the upper airway in our routine practice. Yes, thank you very much. And I think uh, because it's a very simple tool, but I think it means a lot to the patient. When you ask the patient to say, ah, and then you put torch, as a child also, you all must be remembering the way when we used to go to the doctors and the doctor used to use his torch and see our throat and tonsils. You know, that is how something, it is as important as a stethoscope, I think, in the chest practice. So you should always have a torch. One more request is not to use the mobile light. Okay, we all have mobile and then we try to, but we have torch available, so we should be using the torch. We all use torch in our OPD practice. I'm just going to tell you one incident which happened recently. So I had this patient who was uh, around 40 years uh, patient and then he had allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis and converted to invasive aspergillosis. He was in ICU for almost uh, 15 days, went home, came back again in the hospital, again got uh, sick and inside the hospital he was uh, again for 15-20 days. Uh, turned out to have pulmonary embolism. So then pulmonary embolism also was treated, went into sepsis, somehow pulled out all of the, uh, all through this, okay, spent a lot of money in all this. Then he came to the OPD, then he came to the ward, he was shifted to the wards. And then we were thinking that what else we can do for his uh, dyspnea because he was absolutely not improving and he was not able to lie down also. So one fine day, I asked him to open his mouth and that was the first time after say one month of hospitalization, I could see that this patient had so much of submucosal fibrosis and he was barely able to open his mouth. And then we thought about that this patient is actually having some amount of sleep apnea component also. In the ward itself, we put this patient on a, a nasal CPAP and the patient could be discharged in five to six days. 
Okay, so these are like certain very, very important things in the clinical practice and I felt ashamed I even talked to my residents also if they are here, they are listening to, they also will understand that. I thought that, you know, in IPD, we don't give that much of importance because we always get carried away with the X-ray, with the CT scans, with tomorrow what all investigations we are going to do, ABGs, but we forget the basic clinical investigation. So I think that is very, very important to use tool. Dr. Ajay, you want to add something? Yes, please. Yes, yes. I want to just, uh, everybody knows about it, that one important aspect is also that most of the time our OPD is a closed chamber with uh, AC. Uh, we should not forget when we are talking about uh, importance of torch, it is also important that we have a daylight to see the ictus and the pallor. Yes. I see sometimes that is also missing. You know, it's a very, some of the chambers I have seen is having a, like, a, like a hotel, there is a tar light, and the very minimal light and you know we, we why should we have that we should have a window which is open which you can every now and then you can open and at least at time when you are examining daylight is also very important we 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 should remember it's a very old teaching but we should remember it very good very good absolutely now as you are talking i would like to ask you the next question uh, dr ajay do you feel that as a chest physician you all need to have x ray facility and the X-ray facility should be inside your clinic or at least in the vicinity. You feel it is must or you can manage without X-rays? No, I think, uh, yeah, thank you so much for the question. And uh, Dr. Modi, I'd uh, like to ask, share with you that uh, the time has changed now. We have uh, the people who are listening, uh, which might be, you know, 20 years in the practice or 15 years in the practice. And earlier, we didn't have that luxury to have everything at the, at, at uh, you know at your disposal, but now I feel that as a chest physician, uh, we must have uh, an X-ray facility, which is is a call away, you know, which is few uh, meter or maybe a few steps away. The only reason is, as soon as you have a, most of the time the first investigation which patient brings in either with the old record or you want to do at a first investigation is a chest X-ray. Because that is going to decide that whether you will like to, uh, your diagnosis is done and you want further supportive few minimal investigation or you want to take this patient emergency on an on a, uh, on a emergency basis for the bronchoscopy or you want to order a PFT. So that's decided on where you are, that is decided, especially on X-ray. So what is important but that you have to identify where you are working. If it is an institution basis, then you may have an X-ray which is slightly further away, but you can always try to get the X-ray in the least possible way for the, your effective management. And uh, second thing is, suppose you are in a setup where it cannot be asked for, then now with the digital world, you can uh, ask your radiologist as soon as the X-ray is shot, can they send you on the WhatsApp? And you will have a look and immediately you can say, you know, tell the patient, I have asked that get a HRCT done with you know with the proper prone and supine so we can instantly be very effective so i think chest x-ray is not i mean the facility having you should try to do that it should be as there as possible most of the time it should be available with you and even if reporting is not done by radiologist i'm i'm very sure a lot of uh, pulmonologists don't see the printed report and don't ask for it so because we are trained to see the x-ray and then immediately, you know, read it and then you immediately have something or other, you know, a diagnosis, a present to diagnosis or a definitive diagnosis. And then your further thing becomes very easy, very effective. It builds the confidence between the patient and doctor also. The patient generally has been exposed to the CT scan or MRI or X-ray where most of the doctors see the report and then, you know, CT brain and then some people, you know, just will have a, uh, you know, impression that, okay, they are seeing, you know, but really we don't know how much everybody understand. You know, I don't understand too much of CT brain, but sometimes I just see, okay, let me see, you know, what is written. But for X-ray, it's obvious. And, 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 and it should be, uh, we should always strive for that we are very good in X-ray reading. Very rightly said, because I think, uh, uh, certain points which I would like to just emphasize. Two things I think we should not miss in our OPD. One is pleural effusion and another is pneumothorax. Okay. So clinically also you should be able to diagnose them definitely. 
but you want a confirmation. And if you have an X-ray facility just in the vicinity, so I have X-ray in my clinic. Okay, so whenever a patient comes, I mean, and I will say that uh, maybe almost 30 to 40 percent of your OPD patients, you can ask them to get an X-ray done, and none of them will say no. Okay, so wherever you feel that you know you have sufficient space, you have some distance from the X-ray machine, and uh, huh, you have space available, get an X-ray in your clinic. Get X-ray in your clinic or maybe in the vicinity. Second is if you don't have it immediately in your clinic, as Dr. Ajay also said that on WhatsApp, they will be able to share the X-ray film. Most important in all this is why I bought X-ray in my clinic is definitely not to miss the diagnosis. And second is to save my time. Okay. The patient goes to the X-ray. Next day, he comes back with the X-ray. You may lose the patient if he has diffusion pneumothorax. He's already gone to someone else. You don't want to lose that also. So that is the reason and plus you don't want again him to come tomorrow and take your time. So have x-ray immediately comes back in five minutes with the x-ray film and we have software also like in Ruby Hall we have software that you enter the name of the patient and you can see all x-rays not only today even the four years back x-ray CT scan everything you will be able to see on the software. So yeah, that same is how x-rays have evolved they have evolved a lot over this. And as we are discussing that X-rays have evolved and the technology is evolved and we have more and more digital technology. So I would like to ask uh, Dr. Mishra, how is the scenario in Bhubaneswar? So do you still rely on X-ray or you feel that uh, ultrasound has taken a critical role, uh, crucial role in uh, uh, chest practice? And do you feel that uh, ultrasound, instead of X-ray, the ultrasound should be available in our practice? Thank you, sir, for the question. Uh, what I feel is uh, X-ray should always be the first line uh, of investigation. Uh, it is, uh, as, we, as we were always told, that it's a bread and butter of your practice. You always do that first is, uh, it, is the, it is mostly available everywhere, uh, nearby our clinics or in hospitals where we practice. But nowadays, uh, like with the advent of uh, lung ultrasound and more and more pulmonologists uh, getting trained in uh, lung ultrasound, I feel that lung ultrasound is being underutilized in our field. Uh, it's more uh, so used in the emergency department. It's more used in the ICU. But even uh, we can have a lung ultrasound uh, in our uh, own OPD, in our, uh, in our wards, during our rounds. Like, uh, it's the new stethoscope. That's what we say, that lung ultrasound has become the new stethoscope. Because uh, sometimes it so happens that minimal effusions, which the X-ray can miss, uh, lung ultrasound is, uh, has more sensitivity to get that. And uh, suppose we are suspecting a case of pneumothorax. We order a chest X-ray, the technician will come, take the X-ray, get, we get the film. Whereas we can just uh, take the ultrasound probe, we'll put the patient, we'll put the scan, we'll immediately get the signs and we'll see the sliding sign is absent and we'll see the features of pneumothorax and we can immediately take a call. So I feel that uh, more and more uh, pulmonologists uh, should be exposed uh, towards uh, like uh, advantages of lung ultrasound and they should incorporate it into their practice because uh, with a lung ultrasound, we can see the chest wall, we can see the parenchyma, we can see the diaphragm movement and more importantly, uh, the pleural effusion, pneumothorax. So all these are very easy to diagnose and we get a rapid diagnosis and accordingly we can have a good treatment immediately. So I feel that lung ultrasound uh, is the next step ahead. And more importantly, it is cheap, easily available, and has no radiation exposure. So repeatability is also there. Yes. Very right. I think particularly ICU setup. Yes. I mean, because I'm using an institution, and particularly when we have a, any patient who is deteriorating and we are in doubt whether this patient is having a collection which appeared very less, but an ultrasound, a very sick patient, it may be a 500 ml of empyema lying in the right lung. So okay. I think for and for diagnostic or even for doing an investigation, maybe on a ward in a stable patient like pleural biopsy or a putting an in, uh, intercostal chest tube, even if it is a uh, two days old X-ray, I think ultrasound is uh, routinely used. And only problem is because of only challenge which we face is it was not part of the curriculum. But now, uh, as you people may be knowing, that in most of the medical colleges in, in where the you know department and the college is very proactive, they are uh, able to give that you know one month posting or a, 
you know, 15 days of posting of the student, it is now, uh, you know, it's in the curriculum that such and such resident, if possible, uh, with the department, uh, you know, uh, teamwork, they should be able to allow him to leave the department and go and learn a lot of things. Maybe it's a short case, maybe a one day or two day uh, CME where they can learn basic about ultrasound. So now it is getting incorporated, but that was not the story. I will say, Dr. Modi, 10 years back, it was not as common which we are seeing nowadays. That's so, right. Yes, even I feel that uh, ultrasound is uh, required in most of the uh, lung procedures as well as, uh, I mean, uh, it should be available. Just like the X-ray, if you have something like a portable device, you just have a flash of light like a mobile handheld and just put it on the patient's chest and you'll be able to know this is the fluid and then just put a needle. I mean, kya maza I mean, your chest OPD practice will be like boom, you know. So, so I have some of my friends where their uh, uh, spouse is a radiologist. You know, I feel, are wah, kya maza hai. Matlab, whatever they want to do, tapping, whatever they want to do, even a lymph node biopsy, FNAC, just call the spouse and then, you know, they can boom the practice. It's like... Uh, Definitely, there are certain things like this which can definitely be useful in treating the patients and plus you can give uh, results very quickly. So, uh, Dr. Sridevi, do you think Chennai is always very advanced and Chennai is like, uh, you know, South India is all hub of all these latest things. So, something like this is available or is it going to be available just a uh, mobile mail, you have like a torch. Of course, we have this PNDT Act and then those rules we have to follow. Maybe uh, sometimes even chest physicians also will be able to have all those rules of PNDT, we will be able to follow, have those certificates. It will be a for one time. But once you know how to go through it, I think it's a need of our. So, so Dr. Sridevi, is something like this available, handheld, uh, this USG or portable USG systems? Yeah, uh, definitely, sir. I think like, you know, this is uh, going to be the future, I guess. Like, you know, we have uh, handheld portable, uh, you know, the devices, ultrasound devices, which is commonly called as focus, which is point of care ultrasound. Like, you know, you're going to diagnose at the patient's site, wherever the patient is. And they're very handy and easy to take to the patient, wherever the patient is, probably ER, ward, or anywhere, like for that matter. And uh, uh, and this can also help us integrate our history and clinical examination findings, and we can quickly do you know a bedside uh, scan as well at the same point in time, and it sort of integrates the history cl uh, clinical examination findings with the sonographic findings, and we can arrive at a diagnosis uh, within minutes, and without uh, wasting much time, patient can be initiated on appropriate treatment. Uh, for instance, I think like, you know, uh, supposing a patient is walking into emergency and he's having breathlessness. And I think quickly, if you have a focus in your hand, point of care ultrasound, all that you can do is like, you know, breathlessness can be because of variety of reasons, like, you know, it could be cardiac or, you know, lung related. So you can quickly do uh, LV uh, scan, you know, the echo uh, kind of thing, like, you know, to rule out any LV dysfunction, a right heart also you can look at. And then you can look into the pleural space to rule out, uh, you know, pneumothorax or pleural effusions, mm. or any consolidation or, you know, uh, pulmonary edema. All these can be found out. And uh, uh, in a patient suspected to have uh, DVT, again, like, you know, what you can do is quickly take the probe, like, you know, to check if at all the patient is having any, you know, DVT. And if at all it is very difficult, like, you know, for, to gain an IV access, again, like, you know, you can put the probe in and... Uh, uh, you know, uh, to insert an IV axis, like, you know, for arterial lines or any venous lines. This can come as very handy. I think this is going to be the future, I guess. With one device, I think you can do multiple things at, a, at the same time. You can, uh, uh, you know, arrive at a quick diagnosis, thereby wasting the time in the emergency setting. And uh, so definitely, I think this is going to change uh, the way in which we're going to practice in future. And uh, as uh, again, like, you know, there's less radiation exposure as well. And you can keep repeating it multiple times. And you can see, like, you know, if the, you know, supposing a pleural effusion, if it is reducing or what is happening. And uh, uh, so various uh, things you can do it with a point of care ultrasound. I think this is going to be a very useful tool. And I think uh, we should have this in our armamentarium. That's what I feel. Dr. Mahavir, can I ask something to Shridevi? Yes, sir. Yes. Dr. Shridevi, uh, can you help us understand that suppose there is a person who has not been exposed and do not have a facility to learn it, how is the somebody learns it? 
Is yeah, it very exactly. easy? That is important? one of the important things. I think like, you know, we have so much exposure to the, you know, reading the x-rays and the CT scans. Uh, but uh, nowadays, like, you know, the ultrasound chest is included in most of uh, the programs, like, you know, all the CMEs, everything. I think we should have a proper training, like before we have an equipment in hand. There's no point in, uh, you know, not knowing how to, you know, read a few signs which are like, you know, diagnostic of that particular disease. Uh, so mm -hmm. for that, I think you have to undergo a formal training, a good course. I think that will definitely help. Otherwise, there's no point in having it, actually. So yeah, I think like, yeah, you know, nowadays there's so many courses available. I think yeah. uh, we have to definitely learn before we, you know, perform the technique. Yeah. The, 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 the reason I ask you learn is, uh, you know, when you have yeah. a Okay. You start going no. and start using the program. Yeah, it yeah, is yeah. not very difficult. It is not very difficult. It is. Uh, I can give you one example. We had this uh, one patient of severe COVID. Okay, and during COVID time, then we had that uh, lot of patients with acute pulmonary thromboembolism. So uh, these patients, we were not able to shift them. Okay, so shifting them to the uh, uh, CT scan department and then doing a CT pulmonary angiogram. So these patients were really very hypoxic. So these patients, a bedside echo. Even with a USG machine, sometimes because you know that, that time even uh, getting people also was very difficult, and we used to get a big, huge RA RB dilated plus a clot inside the RA, and we are thrombolyzing these patients without doing a CTPM. Okay, so I mean that as you said that even for a IV line also even for a uh, internal jugular vein, so many times this ultrasound can be used. So I think it's um, a very useful tool, and we should be using in our clinical practice. So we the have a lot of questions. Question. The reason I asked this question is to Dr. Shridevi, uh, four years back, I got access to a simulation. Yeah. So for those people who might be having a, a doubt or a curiosity, now there are centers in our country where somebody can get registered and in a couple of days time, uh, they can learn on mannequin, on simulation, and all the signs and everything and how to hold the probe, they can train themselves. Then, you know, initial that fear and that apprehension goes away. And then uh, because we are not radiologists, you know, we are not born radiologists. Yeah. And at the same time, we have to take care that we are not entering into the area of interest of radiologists. Because in times like just gynecologists are doing ultrasound, we should also be de depending on them for the final diagnosis. Because the question comes up being... And, and also, uh, we need to practice every day. It's not like, you know, attending just one session of it, we'll not get the hang of it. I think we have to keep, like, you know, uh, practicing and, like, you know, every day. Only then we'll get to know those crucial signs and all that. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult for us to know because it's, like, totally different, uh, you know, field for us all together. Maybe we'll just move ahead because we yes. have a lot of questions yeah. and, uh, yeah. you know, we can know. Uh, so, uh, okay, we'll come back to basics. Hmm. And uh, we started with Dr. Madhur, so I again want to ask him that now you have developed this chest OPD and uh, you know you have started doing practice, but do you feel, and our practice almost 70-80% of chest practice is airway, we have allergy, asthma, COPD, you feel that a pulmonologist should start with a spirometer and how frequently do you use it and which one do you have? Do you have a spirometry in your clinic? Uh, yes. So definitely, uh, as I said, when I started, initially, I started without a spirometer. Uh, I used to carry a, a peak flow meter. But uh, then gradually, as the days progress, uh, you know, the basic uh, armamentarium you already have. So in that, you have to have a weighing machine and a height scale also. And then I evolved myself when I started getting, say, 10 or more than 10 patients. So I evolved myself and I got a spirometer for myself. Uh, so definitely I am using my uh, a spirometer at my OPD, at my own clinic as well, and uh, in the institute as well. So uh, both of them are a bit different uh, because, you know, uh, in your initial days, you have to have uh, uh, a judgment regarding the cost of the equipment. As we all were talking about ultrasound, just to mention ultrasound, maybe uh, a cheaper, cheaper and easily accessible for patients, but for a doctor to buy an ultrasound machine is a bit costly affair. But for spirometer, you have uh, a few of very good spirometers which you easily can uh, afford and practice. Uh, definitely, I am using a spirometer in my clinic and as well as in the institute as well. So uh, as far as uh, the number of patients are concerned, uh, more than 50% of my patients, they have to undergo a spirometer. One thing I do make sure, 
you always have to rule out clinically at least, or you have to see a recent chest X-ray that they don't have a pneumothorax. I have a good burden of COPD patients where at times I have uh, made them undergo a spirometer and then an X-ray showing a pneumothorax. So, you know, you, you have to be very careful for that. So that I am using a spirometer in my clinic. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think uh, as a chest physician to get recognition, one thing what we all should have is a spirometer. A spirometer is a basic requirement for a chest physician. And uh, uh, the way we can diagnose asthma, COPD, we can monitor your interstitial lung disease patient depending on their FVC, whether they are responding to antifibrotic, whether antifibrotics needs to be given or not to be given. So a lot of decisions which I think we can take based upon the uh, spirometer. So we have lots of spirometers, maybe cost may vary from maybe as low as 50, 60,000 rupees to we have high-end machines which are there in the uh, majority of the tertiary care hospitals which can go in lakhs. So like 15, 20 lakhs of systems are available. So we have different kinds of spirometers and more than 50% of our patients, they will need a spirometer. So I think spirometer is uh, uh, something which all case physicians should start having before starting or as Dr. Madhur also said that he started slowly, slowly, he used PFR first and then once his OPD practice picked up, then he started using the spirometer. So I think that is also a fair idea. But you mentioned about PFR. So somebody who's not able to, you know, immediately invest in spirometer, but he wants to know how which other equipments we can use and how do you manage or monitor your patients or you have done spirometry in the beginning. But every time you cannot keep on doing spirometry or you want to have more confidence in your patient in treatment of asthma. So we have this peak flow meter, which is something which has been studied so long from our UG days, but somehow as a doctor, many of the doctors don't like it. You know, we feel that it is very time consuming to tell the patients how to use it. So Dr. Saumya, do you use it in your clinical practice and uh, uh, where all in what category of patients do you use them? Yes, sir. Uh, that's a nice question. As uh, Dr. Madhu Joshi was mentioning, initially he carried the uh, PFR and then uh, he upgraded himself to spirometer. So I think PFR still has a uh, has its role in our practice because, as you said, repeatability of spirometry is really cumbersome. See, when the, whenever we want the patient to do the uh, just look at his uh, uh, asthma exacerbations or any declining his lung function, uh, maybe sometimes patient won't be willing to travel to hospital and then so that if the patient is carrying a PFR, for that we first have to counsel the patient, educate the patient what is the significance of the PFR and then how to do it first. Uh, we have to come to his baseline value by at least three times repeating it and then the best value you have to take it as we all know. So uh, a patient who is definitely educated, who can understand the plan of having a PFR with him, how to monitor the treatment, how to identify, I think, earlier identification of the exacerbation. If the patient is having an acute exacerbation, what are the red flag signs he has to identify? Probably the patient is uh, not able to travel to the hospital. What else he has to do? So depending on the uh, green zone, uh, yellow zone and the red zone, what we have in the spirometer. So as we all know, more than 80 will be the green, 50 to 80 is the yellow and the less than 50 is the uh, red zone. So whenever that we have to educate the patient how to monitor what is the use of PFR in spite of uh, doing a spirometry when he is not able to travel. And when I'm speaking about the PFR, uh, I just uh, got in my mind regarding a portable spirometer now, which is available. So it is a vitalograph or the alpha spirometer, we call it. It's a yes. portable spirometer and it's uh, used uh, variedly in uh, lung transplant units now. So it is a portable spirometer. It gives the value of FUN by FEC. And uh, the importance of this, and the, the another value, which is FUN by FE6. So the patient's lung transplant early resection, even before the saturation falls down, this uh, FEN by FE6 value, which will be given by the portable spirometer is taken into uh, consideration. And what are the measures which we have to take to prevent the lung rejection are being taken care? This is a very good uh, modality uh, uh, in the lung transplant unit. So PFR still has a role as a way. But there should be a fine tuning and uh, fine balance. And every clinician must be cautioned regarding the overlays on the spiral uh, PFR measurements. 
and uh, we have to know maybe sometimes patient might not be willing to come to the hospital he might falsely reassure us my pfr is absolutely fine so please maintain a fine balance between the uh, subjective symptoms as well as the objective data clinically how the patient is doing depending on the history so there should be a fine balance before we take the next step for upgrading or downgrading the treatment while the patient is on pfr how is he documenting whether he is documenting everything properly whether he is understanding what is our main motto behind giving the pfr so that should be taken care well enough so that is where pfr what i feel is pfr has still uh, has a role in our practice thank you thank you dr somya excellent answer because i think many of our listeners they all must be saying that oh, we know this but knowing this and doing this there is a lot of difference okay so i think this is a very simple equipment which we have to use to set up your chest practice just like a hypertension clinic a physician they keep on checking the blood pressure they keep on checking the sugar level is the same way i think pfr is something which can be used you should have a lot of mouth pieces also with this because that is something which has to be changed in your clinical practice so you keep disposable mouth piece also along with this pfr and keep it on the table keep it on the table plus you ask the patient to purchase one have a chart and then you know it makes a lot of difference for asthmatic patient initially they were used to use it but when you tell the patient that see initially your reading was 250 after one year of after one or two months of this inhaled corticosteroid your baseline reading has gone up to 350 360 so that gives so much of boost in his treatment that the patient gets lot of compliance with the treatment the patient becomes compliant with the treatment and he will follow up with you also very regularly you will have very good control on your asthma and second point also what you mentioned very rightly is the handheld spirometers which are available for especially for patients of post transplant patients so over there also these uh, spirometers are used and uh, there are patients where interstitial lung disease patients they do their pft at home every day to know their fpc so that is how this even uh, whatever the clinical trials we have for newer and newer antifibrotic drugs they have daily fpc monitoring for these patients so any kind of adverse effect any kind of infection if they are catching up so they, they, that should be able to picked up by the uh, spirometers also so moving ahead that uh, dr sridevi just mentioned about uh, different types of uh, flow charts or different types of question there is what we as chest physician should be kept handy on our desk especially for asthma copd so in bhubaneswar dr mishra what is the protocol do you keep this kind of uh, again there is a difference between i know it and i do it so do you use this kind of questionnaires for maybe for asthma control or for copd patient and do you feel that it should be kept in your practice how much impact it will have in your practice uh thank you sir for the question uh so the thing is uh, there's one thing called as theoretical and then one is practical so practically speaking uh, it is not possible to use these questionnaires for every patient yeah. because most of the patients and i can say almost 90% of my patients of asthma and copd that turn up in the opd they are due to non compliance their questions are like sir do i get addicted to this do i need to take this can i not get something else that like why do i need to take an inhaler so uh, assessing the patient based on the questionnaire uh, takes a step back and uh, i have i'm like more uh, in my practice i'm more uh, inclined towards explaining to them how the inhaler works how it is important for your uh, like it is like it is just like you take medicines for your hypertension diabetes similarly these medicines are this is in the inhaler form inhaled form and they directly act on your lungs so assessing these patients on the basis of a questionnaire it is more like we do have questionnaires in the opd but uh, like i said we don't use it in an everyday practice because uh, the patients themselves have uh, other types of uh, problems mostly non compliance because of their fear of addiction of being on steroids like steroids will make them fat or their bones will melt they have certain questions like that so addressing these things become more important so yes i do not use uh, on my on a daily basis these questionnaires but yes they should be used as and when possible uh, to assess uh, the quality of life of the patient uh, who are on inhalers who are adherent to inhalers 
and whether they are uh, still having uh, symptoms despite being on optimal amount of inhaled uh, steroids or bronchodilators like uh, do they need a step up do they need to be evaluated for biologics so these things are required definitely but yeah on the practical front i do not use it on a daily basis good and thank you for the honest answer we all find this difficult but i will tell you a trick for this and how do i do in my practice you don't have to do it yourself if you keep on doing this and filling up the questions it is difficult but you train your pft technician you <coughs> your receptionist okay maybe you can mark the uh, whenever patient comes to you asthma practice or asthma patient or copd patient maybe as a red star on his file or on his prescription next time they come they are sitting in the uh, reception reception is hands over this asthma control questionnaire or maybe a cat score or maybe a pft technician after doing the pft he will tell that next time when you come first visit me i will give you this questionnaire and let him mark that how was his symptoms last time and how it has been this time and it is it definitely works okay so there are certain yes, things which i feel that you know they are difficult but if we set them into practice they are not that difficult and this again will definitely give you an upper edge as compared to rest of the physicians even the rest of the chest physicians to implement your chest knowledge into the practice so i think this is a very important tool and we all can start using in our practice so uh, dr sidhiv you mentioned about the uh, i want quick answer for this question you mentioned about the board index and uh, uh, cat score so you feel which category of patients you use and are they different or they can be used interchangeably uh so mainly cat scoring system size i already mentioned in detail i think during my presentation itself uh, cat score takes into consideration more of the symptomatic aspect of the patient and it can give us an idea as to how much the patient is at risk of exacerbation and it also tells uh, as an account of mortality um, morbidity and mortality uh, uh, in patients with copd whereas the uh, board index on the other hand it has multiple uh, variables like it includes uh, like dyspnea as one of the symptom uh, but the other parameters like the body mass index the obstruction and uh, you know the 6 uh, minute walk test which uh, um, uh, mainly focuses on the exercise tolerance of the patient so it's a comprehensive tool uh, kind of uh, tool uh, for the copd patients i think a patient who is not able to like walk or we cannot like you know include all the parameters what uh, needs to be included in a board index i think you can just go for a cat score i think that will be more easier for us to use during the opd you can as you said sir like we can train somebody and ask them to just tick the you know questions as to as, um, whatever the points and that can be more useful i feel and uh, board index is definitely time consuming uh, we can just go for cat score but uh, maybe we have handful of these copd patients in your practice which you start thinking and you feel oh i have this patient who has very severe copd i have that patient who has also very severe copd so maybe for those handful of patients we can start using board index and then you know when they come for follow up and then you see that how much is the improvement okay so that is how something at least for some category of patient we can use board index as you said uh, nicely and for all other category of patients we can use uh, cat score so moving ahead i think dr ajay we have a question for you and uh, because there is a lot of technology and we are already doing this pfr monitoring we are doing spirometry and we have having lot of this equipments in our uh, uh chest uh, basket so one of this is this exhaled nitric oxide okay so this has become a new tool in our clinical practice and which is available maybe for last uh, maybe four or five years and uh, i use it in my clinical practice sometimes i use sometimes i don't use so where do you feel the necessity of using peno in your clinical practice is it available with you or do you refer to someone how do you and does it do you really feel that it is going to be useful in the practice yeah thank you so much for the uh, good question in fact and uh, uh, i think uh, for patients who are uh, uh, in a in a gray zone we really don't know whether this patient is uh, having uh, symptoms which are mimicking like asthma yes. or we are having a patient who is giving history which is not forthcoming we are not able to get tft or pft is normal there i feel that pheno test is very important ha huh. at the same time i would like to declare that i don't have you know in my institute i have not used it but it's a guess a coincidence just 15 days back i did order one of my um, known family you know patient to get pheno done and fortunately it came uh, negative 
and that is why that is how we I can come to a conclusion that okay this patient has more of allergic symptoms related to upper respiratory tract and little bit of um, spasm for a short period of time i will hesitate i will hold on for myself to label it as a frank case of bronchial asthma so i think pheno is a wonderful test it is non invasive it tells about eosinophilic inflammation it takes it checks about your fraction of exhaled nitric oxide and it can be done in a very young age of you know 5 year and beyond so that is an advantage uh, but at the same time we have to take into consideration that how many people can uh, really uh, say yes to this test and how many people as a physician can in the beginning can have this uh, test in the arm ventrum of next you know before ios before fot pf spirometry in fot uh, uh, if it is established then only we can plan of getting in pheno or we would like to have pheno in the beginning so my answer is big no pheno is a kind of a luxury as most of the institute as a research tool are using it but in day to day practice you know if you can refer because that number is going to be very small and uh, for a chest patient to uh, not only buy and uh, to maintain it may not be you know i really don't know what about you dr mahavir in pune how many people how many people right is it? said it's a luxury it's a luxury you have those category of patients where you know you want to convince them to start using ics so i have in my practice okay i don't use it that frequently as you said rightly for a, a beginner it may not be affordable for himself as well as for the patient also sometimes it may not be too much value addition but when you have a patient where as you said their gray zone asthma copd whether to give ics not to give ics so those category of patients it really works and second thing is it can be also be used in the follow up okay so whether the airway inflammation has come down and the patient's uh, you know the spirometry values may not change immediately but the pheno is something which can definitely help a lot in those category of patients even in patients with allergic rhinitis those mm -hmm. who don't have asthma and the, where the lung function is absolutely normal spirometry is normal but in these patients also pheno is able to pick up the airway inflammation inside the bronchi mm -hmm. okay so i have seen lot of patients with allergic rhinitis with no coexistent asthma but still the pheno values are on the higher side so again these are the patients where you know you can start with inhaled corticosteroids for those category of patients but as you said rightly that uh, not a big no but uh, it's not like a must armamentarium in our uh, clinical practice uh, uh, at present so uh, thank you very much for uh, wonderful answer and although it is not available with uh, one person but uh, if it is available in your city you can definitely take uh, help from the other colleagues and then uh, you can start uh, using it so just like uh, we have pheno and now you want to become a big chest physician okay you don't want to just uh, label yourself only as doing spirometry because spirometry is something which uh, even lot of technicians are moving around and they're keeping doing spirometry here and there so you want to establish yourself as a chest physician you want to give some more information to the patient you have a lot of patients with this interstitial lung disease your patients with this you want to run the ild clinic and you want to know not only the fvc but you want to know lot of other lung volumes what is the tlc what is the rv and then you want to maybe refer a patient to a lung transplant unit so you have this lot of these other tests like we have body box system available then we have this diffusion system available i don't have it in my practice because i feel it is uh, not possible for one person to have it in the clinic but in the institute we have it and in the institute we are using it for lot of patients and it works well in some of these patients so dr madhu what do you feel that um, what is the trend in uh, your place do you use this diffusion system and do you think they are like must armamentarium in the chest practice uh so definitely uh as far as our own uh, clinic and setup is concerned so i am limited uh, with the spirometry uh, which uh, uh, is a turbine based and a very simple one uh, the range is between 30 to 40000 as you said but uh, the place where i am working in it is a institute so uh, we have a projects uh, and uh, uh, we have some data collection going on with icmr and various other things so uh, there we have uh, uh, uh lung diffusion studies uh, as well so uh, it is a, a helium based uh, lung diffusion uh, test that we are doing at our uh, institute uh, but not at my clinic yes i don't have a pheno as well uh, not even a lung diffusion study but at institute uh, we are doing it and i am also using it at the institute 
So whenever a patient who comes to my clinic and I have to get it done, I usually send my patient to the institute uh, to get it done. Yes, absolutely right. I mean, uh, it is not a must thermometer, but as I said that as your practice evolves and you want to develop more and more specialty, super specialty into your practice, definitely the equipments like the division system as well as body box, they can be useful. And uh, as I said that the chest is now not limited to the, uh, uh, you know, just broad chest category. It is going into more and more subspecialties. And then we have patients for lung transplant. Then we have patients where we can have a separate ILD kind of practice or ILD clinic. So I think if somebody is interested in having those kind of practice, definitely a diffusion system, a body box, they can be used in the uh, clinical practice. So uh, moving ahead, so I think one is a PFT and second thing is to get yourself as a recognition as a case physician is a bronchoscope. So I remember 22, 23 years back when I started my practice, first thing what I did was there were two choices. One is to buy a Maruti Alto and second was to buy a bronchoscope. And what did I prefer? I had, I could get loan of 5 lakhs rupees, not my own money, but I could get loan of 5 lakhs rupees. So I thought I will get a bronchoscope first and I will use somebody else's car whenever I want to go or I will use an auto rickshaw and I will use, but I first purchase the bronchoscope. So Dr. Samya, what do you feel that for a chase physician to recognize himself or herself, is it must to start with the bronchoscope, at least a diagnostic bronchoscope. We are not talking about interventional pulmonology where you know you are doing a lot of uh, procedures, but a basic bronchoscope may not be a video bronchoscope only a flexible bronchoscope also. What do you feel? You are muted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a tricky question actually. So, sir, uh, now uh, to, to be honest, 50% of our lung patients are taken care by the general physicians. So everywhere. So whoever the patients are coming to Apollo, so first they see the general physician, uh, uh, they start on some inhaler, some x-ray and then some antibiotics for pneumonia and patient would have used everything and then they come up and end up here. So so as a patient, uh, as an ophthalmologist does uh, ophthalmoscopy with an ophthalmoscope, and uh, an uh, ENT does it with an otoscope or laryngoscope, now it has become something a norm like, okay, you need something, uh, some sample from your lungs. They are very, uh, patients are Googling too much now. So that, okay, you are not getting better with any of these medications from the general physician. Go to a bronco, uh, pulmonologist for, to get a bronchoscopy done. So now this has become like if you, uh, if, the, if your uh, patients are already coming with some sputum negative, culture negative, TB gene expert negative, still they are not getting better. So they are ending up with us. So now it has become, uh, uh, an important uh, uh, thing to rule out, like a basic diagnostic bronchoscopy has become an important tool for us to diagnose as, as in the scenario what, what I have just discussed with you. So in this era, probably whenever there is an indication, do not hesitate to go for uh, a quick bronchoscopy to get a good sample lavage and then send it for investigations. And if you have a little critical care experience, with some, uh, with someone in even in your clinic. So now that we have, uh, you are, as you rightly said, fiber optic bronchoscopy is available uh, to as far as I know, some some five to six lads. So probably if you have someone with you who can monitor uh, the patient's vitals with some midazolam, with some uh, fentanyl, you can manage to get a quick bronchoscopy done and a quick ball sample which you need to diagnose it. So. And if you have an anesthetist, uh, if you are working in an institute, it's a luxury for us to have an anesthetist by our side who can monitor everything, who can stabilize the patient with some good amount of uh, anesthesia he gives and uh, uh, the patient never coughs during the procedure. Definitely, it's a luxury. So what I feel is, in our even if it's a clinic, probably nowadays it has become an essential thing in the practice. At least whenever uh, you being a pulmonologist, you should have an extra edge from the general physicians. So I think whenever there is an indication, do not hesitate, go for a bronchoscopy. Yeah, that's what I feel, sir. Very rightly said. You said tricky question, but you gave tricky answer also. <laughs> okay, because there is a very gray line. When you have a bronchoscope available, when you are doing it in a small setup, you go inside, you see that there is a 
endobronchial mass sitting inside the right main bronchus. As a test physician, you won't be hesitant to take a biopsy because you know it will be so desperate for you to. I want to give a diagnosis to the patient. Now, if patient is spending five six thousand rupees, my job is to give a diagnosis to the patient, and then you will not be hesitant to take a biopsy and. By chance, if there is bleeding and if you are not able to control it in your OPD, then it will be difficult. So, for everybody, I will suggest that you know, young days we all have gone through this. We have done a lot of those kind of mistakes. But a bronchoscopy is something which is I feel that even the diagnostic bronchoscopy, you should be able to draw a line that even if I see a mass, I am going to send this patient to a place where everything is. Available and then only I'm going to take a biopsy from this particular lesion. So a diagnostic bronchoscopy may be a probably a lavage for a patient who's not able to bring out a sputum. You have a patient who's uh, maybe a zero positive and then uh, you just want to collect a lavage for this kind of patient, or you have a patient where you just want to assess for the maybe vocal cords or maybe a tracheal lumen. So those kind of things. I think those can be done safely, but a big big no. For a biopsy in a setup. So moving forward now, suppose now Soumya has evolved. She has now done this uh, basic bronchoscopy, but she feels that no, no, I want to go to a next level. And then she moves to Bhubaneswar and she goes and joins Dr. Mishra. And she tells Dr. Mishra that uh, I want to develop a bronchoscopy suite where I want to take a lot of biopsies. I want to do everything, whatever is possible in the interventional pulmonology. We know that IP is a different set. And we are not going to discuss about all procedures related to IP. But Dr. Mishra, if you want to develop such kind of bronchoscopy suite, where at least you will be able to do a reasonable number of uh, bronchoscopic biopsies, maybe an EBUS. So, what all things are required in armamentarium of a chase physician to develop this kind of practice? Thank you for the question, sir. Uh, most importantly, we need to have a good team. Uh, before we go start any of these advanced bronchoscopy procedures, even in basic bronchoscopy, I feel uh, we need to have a dedicated nursing uh, staff who uh, addresses to the patients, uh, prepares them uh, with pre-oxygenation and all these lignocin sens sensitivity tests and uh, secure the line. Then there needs to be a bronchoscopy technician. I know it's a uh, luxury, not everyone... Uh, gets a bronchoscopy technician, plus the training also is not uh, like in this country, the bronchoscopy technician, uh, specifically bronchoscopy uh, training uh, for technicians uh, is very limited. Most of them are trained in ga gastro, like endoscopy and colonoscopy. But uh, yes, uh, having a dedicated team uh, is first. You need to have uh, a team of pulmonologists who are uh, trained in interventions, who have interest in interventions. And then when it comes to the setup, I feel that uh, uh, we should have uh, a good backup uh, support from the ICU, uh, an anesthetist, because when it, when it comes to interventions, when it comes to bronchoscopies or biopsies, uh, EBUS, if there is something to that something will go wrong, like if there is something that should go wrong, it will go wrong. And... Uh, a patient, uh, absolutely stable patient, might get an MI on the table while doing bronchoscopy. Uh, might desaturate, go into respiratory distress. We might need to intubate the patient and then shift the patient. Suppose we took a biopsy and it was very vascular, and uh, after the first bite itself, it bled, the patient bled a lot. So, the, with the uh, like, along with the different types of. Uh, uh, scopes like endoscope, bronchoscope, uh, ebuscope. We also need to have the accessories like Fogarty uh, to occlude uh, in case of excessive bleeding. And we need to have the backup of uh, coal saline. We need to have uh, tranexamic acid, ADR, and of course, a dedicated ICU backup. And uh, it's possible an anesthetist is definitely required. When we are going in for uh, longer procedures, uh, if we are going for rigid bronchoscopy, then absolutely it has to be done in an OT setup with uh, proper backup support. So yes, setting up a bronchoscopy suite for advanced procedures, it uh, needs to be uh, uh, as per protocol. And 
it should be done in a stepwise manner and uh, definitely it should be uh, done by a group of trained pulmonologists who are doing interventions who are trained in interventions so yeah that should be the way thank you thank you so much and congratulations to all of you because we have 1064 uh, live logins and people are still listening to us uh, dr sridevi do you differ and uh, do you want to add anything how will you like to uh, develop this bronchoscopy suite in your institute yeah uh so ideally i think like the if at all like i have to develop a bronchoscopy suite like in an ideal scenario i think the room size definitely matters because like there are going to be so many things the patient the equipment the nursing staff the doctor performing probably anesthetic standby so it should be of a reasonable size and uh, preferably a negative pressure room because like, you know, the procedure itself is going to generate a lot of bio aerosol and you don't want, you know, uh, that aerosol like, you know, going into the other rooms and contaminating them. So in an ideal scenario, it should be a negative pressure room if possible, or at least like, you know, uh, it should be well ventilated so that at least there should be at least 12 air circulations per hour, which can easily happen. So uh, second main thing is like, you know, you should have the crash cart ready because you're going to stick a bronchoscope into the airways and anytime anything can happen. So that has to be definitely uh, present in the bronchoscopy suite itself. So which includes all the emergency medications uh, plus, you know, your cardiorespiratory equipment, including a defibrillator, all that should be in place. And uh, you should have a oxygen uh, a port, a central supply or at least an oxygen uh, cylinder in place and uh, suction, the wall mount suction, like, you know, in case if you're performing a bronchoscopy, that comes handy. And uh, another suction is also required in case if at all the patient is going to have some oral secretions. So ideally two suctioning systems should be in place. And uh, of course, like, you know, the uh, staff, it should be well-trained staff. You cannot have like somebody who's not uh, trained to handle kind of emergency. You should have, you should uh, train the nurses prior and also like you know better to have anesthetist standby in case if you are contemplating any kind of uh, you know a complication during the procedure or in a high risk patient i think all these are i think you should uh, mandatory whenever you are considering like you know ideal uh, bronchoscopy suite and uh, before performing the you know uh, technique here yeah. yeah very well said i think the most important is uh, of course the team and uh, a good bronchoscopist as dr atul mehta always says a good bronchoscopist is the one who knows when not to scope. Okay, so I think we have to draw our own line and we should know our limitation, where we are doing the procedure, what kind of scenarios are there and what kind of complications can be anticipated. So these complications may not be only during uh, doing a bronchoscopy. Around uh, 10 years back when I was uh, in my clinic and I had got this new PFT machine and I was too excited. So I was doing a lot of uh, lung function tests in these patients. And one patient, after giving salpetamol, so this patient, she just collapsed. She collapsed and there was nothing available in my OPD. And uh, I got completely frightened that what is to be done. And this girl, her pulse was okay, her BP was okay, but she was completely paralyzed. She was not moving at all. And afterwards, I came to know that it may be salpetamol induced hypokalemia and which made her completely paralyzed. After that day, I thought that in my clinic also, there has to be some basic emergency setup which should be available because we get patients with asthma, with COPD. And even if you have told them that in case of emergency, please don't come to my clinic. You can go to nearby hospital. But poor patients, they want to see you. They want that touch from you. They will inevitably come to your OPD. So Dr. Ajay, you feel that in your OPD, do you feel that some kind of emergency kit should be available. Do you keep them? You feel that it is very, very difficult to keep these kind of emergency medicines with you. And uh, what is your take on this? Uh, yeah, you reminded me of my old, good old days. Uh, I think uh, as soon as I could afford, I had in that armamentarium oxygen cylinder. Because in OPD, we didn't have a central, center line. So our first thing I purchased was that time it oxygen concentrated was not so famous. So I remember buying a oxygen cylinder, a smaller one, but uh, useful, very useful, even though probably I did not use it for months, but mm -hmm. it was so, so important for medical legal purpose also. So I feel uh, in our emergency kit, we have to have all the drugs which can take care of vasovagal and IV excess and intubation. And, and, and if required, then you should be able to transport from the bedside, from that bed, you know. And in that scenario, then I think you should have 
a mini crash card where all the drugs are available the intubation um, you know whole kit is available you can connect it you can have ambo and during that period then you know you will get that much of time when the patient is not pulseless and he is not having cardiac arrest and i feel oxygen is one of the most important thing if in in various setup if somebody don't have um, you know luxury to have a central line in their opd also it's very convenient nowadays to keep uh, you know maybe oxygen concentrator but only problem is it will not deliver more than 5 liter and we require 10 liter and more uh, in a patient who is really severely hypoxic so i think it in today's world uh, we should have not only our uh, indemnity cover but as well as we should have uh, it should not be required so we have the first step is to cover up with the all the emergency medicines Uh, in the excellent, opening, excellent also. answer. I think this is where the experience stands, and uh, that's that the reason that you know, as your uh, age advances, you will be able to give more and more such kind of feedbacks. And uh, oxygen cylinder is something which is very very important, and you can keep in your uh, uh, practice. Uh, you can, and I mean, I have uh, even injectable. Although we know that derifiline should not be used, but I do keep injectable derifiline, injectable dexamethasone in my OPD. It has saved lives at least. the nebulizer also and with this i was able to transfer the patient shift the patient to the um, at least the critical care unit whenever um, uh, the thing was required so i think um, we have to keep those basic kind of equipments uh, with us so moving ahead that um, we have discussed about allergy asthma we have discussed about the question uh, different kind of uh, you know asthma copd question is we have discussed about bronchoscopy pheno advanced pft but something which is again very unique for clinical practice and as a budding pulmonologist if you get a case of pleural effusion i feel that you know you get wow this is like my patient and i want to give complete justice to this patient because that is where your specialty many of the times our patients you know asthma patients copd patients ild patients they keep on coming back to you and they are not like result oriented like in ent practice you take out tonsil you take out foreign body and patient feels wow something is done in a cardiac practice you put a stent you give thrombolyte and patient is like wow nothing else i am completely fine but in chest practice you don't get that much of rewards from your patients you know they because they keep on coming back to you again and again but one such area is pleural tapping so i love doing pleural tapping you know because when you take out one liter of fluid and then the patient feels wow sir i feel very light and i feel that my breath is has gone away then he has to take 6 months of ekt or malignancy that is different but it gives a reward to you so do you do this kind of even pleural tapping in opd one should be able to do pleural tapping in the opd or you won't be doing it so uh, dr madhur what is your take on this or you uh, should, should be un- only under uhg guidance because nowadays everybody says that it should be under uhg guidance and you should not be doing pleural tapping in the opd so what is your take on this so uh, definitely uh, there was a time when uh, we were not so hesitant uh, in doing a pleural tapping in our uh, opd so one thing before that i would like to mention whether it is pleural tapping whether it is icd insertion or whether it is your basic bronchoscopy always and always have a iv line in place before switching on to any procedure so uh, definitely we do uh, uh, diagnostic pleural tappings and therapeutic pleural tappings on opd basis uh, but i do make sure that iv line is in place and i do have something to resuscitate the patient uh, a couple of uh, experiences that i have uh, had uh, vesovagal uh, is not uncommon so uh, a few patients who are uh, undergoing you know many of our patients they have uh, they gave a history that they have never visited a hospital they were never sick and now they are uh, going undergoing a pleural tap so there are a few subset of patients you know if you will just inject your local anesthesia and they'll go into vesovagal so you have to be prepared so i never uh, do any of my tapping without a iv cannula one as far as ultrasound is concerned whenever it is available i do prefer uh, that i do a ultrasound uh, at the outset but i make sure that even if i don't have an ultrasound at least i send that patient to a radiologist to at least get a uh, usg thorax and the mark uh, pointed out with in a specific position where the uh, where, which is the best site for his pleural tap so this is the basic uh, I, now i have uh, been following in 
uh yes definitely if uh, uh, at my clinic i don't have any resuscitative uh, measures i do keep iv cannulas uh, safe and i do have an oxygen cylinder for them but i still prefer that if i have a backup of resuscitating uh, that patient at least iv line and a normal saline at the bedside will save your life in case of emergencies very nicely said i mean this huh? is definitely required that uh, don't because you know you feel that very confident i can do it in my opd but you won't be able to save yourself medical legally in case of any mishap a vasovagal can happen i can tell you one small incidence one uh, one of my resident he called me at the middle of the night and said that so this patient has come with right opaque hemithorax and uh, uh, he's under uh, cardiac care but they have given us urgent reference for icd insertion i at 3 o'clock in the morning if resident calls you and uh, you feel that what is the underlying history so the patient has rheumatic heart disease i said okay kal subah dekhte hain abhi sirf needle dal maximum but don't put icd he puts needle in only 150 ml of fluid comes out and then he again calls sir only 150 ml of hemorrhagic fluid has come out i uh, shall i put icd i said no don't put icd tomorrow morning we'll see and next day morning the cardiologist comes he does an echo and the entire right hemithorax is basically dilated right atrium and right ventricle because of the patient who's having a severe rheumatic heart disease okay this has been described in the literature that so that is the role of your uhg so don't put a blind needle okay the gone are the days where we you and me we used to do a blind pleural tapping at least as dr madhur also said that if it is not available with you bedside ask the patient to spend few more uh, i mean the rupees on this get an ultrasound done confirm that it is fluid get a marking done maybe your marking and his marking is not same but you still have a marking on his chest okay and then if you feel clinically no no this is not the right mark my mark is one space below this you can put needle one space below that's okay but to save yourself medical legally as well as for the safety of the patient i think it is very important for you to have a ultrasound based uh, pleural tapping in your practice so this can definitely save yourself as well as uh, the patient in your clinical practice so moving ahead uh, okay but now as i said that pleural tapping many times we get patients they are coming from even all kind of physicians general practitioners they come to you with a pleural tapping report okay there are exudative there are 10 percent mesothelial cells and your rules say that no no you cannot just start the patient on anti tb drugs because he doesn't have typical tb history there are 10 15 percent mesothelial cells how do i start this patient on uh, uh, tb medications so you have decided that no i will like to have something more diagnostic and in this diagnostic we have pleural biopsies so now medical thoracoscopies are available but still at places i think pleural biopsies are done there are uh, people i think dr lanjewar also has a uh, uh, lot of study on this pleural biopsy so dr soumya uh, what do you feel that pleural biopsies do you do is it like a lost art because of this medical thoracoscopy and how much it is required is it available those kind of needle the copes needle the abrams needle and do you use them in your clinical practice uh sir yeah uh thanks for the question sir so in uh, here we can anyway do the uh, thoracoscopies medical thoracoscopies with these but in patients in uh, who are not willing to take the risk who are not willing to take the risk of a general anesthesia who is not a fit patient and uh, after all they will be thinking okay after taking this much risk after uh, investing this much uh, money so this is just a diagnostic tool this is not the treatment of the problem so once they realize they might not be willing to undergo thoracoscopy on the other hand so patients uh, in resource limited settings so we might not be able to do a thoracoscopy in that uh, resource limited settings and in uh, in patients who may we cannot operate probably uh, pleural biopsy is one of the very important tool which we have to make use of so especially uh, the needles which are available even with the ult- associated with the ultrasound as well as the ct guidance are yields more uh, better uh, outcome as well as the yield uh, percentage of the yield is also very good not a blind biopsy which we better not to attempt a blind biopsy but go with the ultrasound or the ct guided biopsy uh, even uh, while doing the ultrasound or the ct guided biopsy 
if you uh, there is uh, some cautions has to be taken definitely sir, maybe so, maybe so, maybe. so if you look at a uh, 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 plural nodule maybe which maybe. is around 2 cm uh, don't be too eager to take that 2 cm uh, plural nodule under the guidance of the ultrasound go for a smaller size nodule because the risk of the bleeding is too high with the 2 to 3 cm nodule so don't be uh, too uh, eager to get that large uh, nodule but go with a smaller nodule. Where the bleeding disc will be, you can't judge that, but bleeding disc will be comparatively less with the smaller nodules. Especially uh, even the ultrasound guidance or the CT guidance with the contrast CT, if the pleural phase is an ideal time to get the biopsy done. And the, even the outcome is also reasonably good. If the, under the guidance if the pleural biopsy is done, the outcome and the yield is around 60 to 70% in TB and uh, around 60% in the malignancies as far as the literature. I didn't uh, 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 read a lot of literature on this, but there are articles that the yield is 60 to 70% even in the um, TB malignancy, it's a little less, around 60%. So in the resource limited settings, where the patient is not a fit candidate for thoracoscopy, definitely you have to make use of the needles and then to get their biopsy, to get a good histopathology report, probably we should definitely give it a try. It's not a loss to what I feel. Excellent answer, Dr. Somnia. In a resource limited setting, and plus when you feel the patient is not fit for general anesthesia, because anyway, uh, if not general, even local also, people are doing medical thoracoscopy under local, but turning the patient to one side and then uh, uh, giving some kind of sedation that may not be possible for some of the patients. Of course, pleural biopsy cannot be a substitute for medical thoracoscopy, but for a beginner, for someone who is not trained in medical thoracoscopy, it doesn't mean that you cannot diagnose a pleural tumor. Ultrasound guided pleural biopsy, whenever you want to send a patient for medical thoracoscopy, just think, just think once that is it possible for me to do a biopsy under ultrasound by using a needle. It can save a lot of money, it can save a lot of pain for these patients and we, if you are not doing even we have interventional radiologists, those will be able to go to that particular region and do a USG guided plural biopsy also from the suspected nodule. So that is a very uh, valid answer. Dr. Ajay, will you like to add something? Yeah, in fact, uh, you know, we had a discussion earlier. Uh, Dr. Mahavir, what happened, you know, we as a country is so diverse. And uh, as uh, Dr. Somai was saying that one of the indication of thoracoscopy is, uh, I mean, I feel that in most of the times, if our patients are uh, not affording and if, if if and they're not accessible to a setup where it's very routinely done in that scenario we should not deprive that person for an early diagnosis so i mean just lately two years back i i just want to share one of our department pg uh, i gave the topic and i provided with the a biopsy force I borrowed from one of my best friend from gondia dr ratna parkhi and then we what we did was we did, she took 70 cases so as Dr. Soumya has rightly said, out of 70 cases, uh, around 70% of the cases we could diagnose malignancy and tuberculosis very well. 70%. 20% cases, it was indeterminate. And in 10% cases, it was, uh, you know, tissue was inadequate. So one thing I want to, uh, you know, just emphasize here, if those people who have not been trained, learning curve is a little difficult for as far as pupil biopsy is concerned. We need to learn by with the help of somebody who is expert. And then, uh, you know, know about it that this is the area where I will not venture, you know, contraindication, breeding tendency, uh, and if any patient who has got chest trauma, refracture, don't do it. But if you have a large effusion, you can have a space where you can enter with your biopsy needle. Abraham is uh, the best, you know, doesn't have more complication. Oh, we should be able to do it because if it is not possible, then definitely the center where it is very, you know, huge bulk is done, and uh, the patient can, uh, is prepared now. Okay, now thoracoscopy is a must, you know. And then that is the time when even patient is in a position to agree and spend money. Great, great. 70% diagnostic rate in 70 patients. So I think this is something which is uh, a very good number. And we should be always thinking about doing a closed pleural biopsy or ultrasound guided pleural biopsy. I think that is a takeaway from this particular question. So moving ahead, then we have another subspeciality in our armamentarium and where... I think a lot of OPD patients we miss, we still miss, as a chest physician also we miss, is sleep apnea. 
we have a patient with resistant asthma, you are doing all kinds of things, you are giving the patient biological, you are putting them on say 2 lakhs rupees therapy per month and you are basically missing sleep apnea. So do you feel Dr. Mishra that the sleep apnea needs to be evaluated more carefully and we should have some kind of question is which Dr. Sridevi also mentioned that uh, you know they should be kept handy in our clinical practice. So you feel that it's a need of our for uh, diagnosing this patient based upon this uh, question is for sleep apnea. Thank you for the question, sir. Uh, to begin with, I would like to say that uh, the center where I work, uh, Kim's Bhubaneswar, we have a level one uh, sleep study facility. Uh, it's the only one in the state. So we are very proactive in uh, screening patients for uh, sleep apnea, and we subject them to polysomnography as well. So in all, uh, in a, in a, every uh, consultant's OPD, we have the Epworth sleepiness scale. Uh, we have a printout over there and we take, uh, we screen the patients. And as we all know, the Epworth Sleepiness Scale has parameters, eight parameters, and from zero to three, we score it. So based on that, if any patient is scoring more than 11, then uh, also uh, like they are more likely to have a high risk for OSA. So then we have the stop bank questionnaire as well. So we assess them on the basis of history, like uh, we asked their uh, relatives that uh, does the patient snore? Do they have a snoring problem? And most of the patients complain of that, that snoring karate bahut lete So that is one uh, symptom which uh, should not be ignored. If any patient is coming uh, with a history of snoring, we should suspect sleep apnea. We should uh, subject the patient to an ESS, a sleepiness skill, then stop bank scoring. And if there is a stop bank score like uh, S for snoring, T for tiredness, uh, O for over observed sleep apnea that the patient's attendant will give, that they wake up middle of night and they have a high BP problem, suppose suddenly they have developed high hypertension. And then uh, if their BMI is why they are obese patients, they have a short neck and male patients. In all these patients, there should be a high suspicion of uh, OSA. And after subjecting them to these questionnaires, we should take them up for a polysomnography and a quick diagnosis of PSG and uh, sleep, uh, like uh, positive airway pressure titration uh, could help the patient uh, in a long run. So yeah, we should definitely have these uh, scoring systems in the OPD in our daily practice. Yes, I think that will definitely again uh, increase our conversion rate because just telling the patient that you should do sleep study, it may not be sounding him that important. But when you justify that these are 10 questions, so these are 8 points and out of that you have scored 10 or 11. So that is the reason that you should be doing this particular sleep study. So this gives them a good objective evidence and these patients can be definitely converted to a level 1, level 2 kind of uh, sleep study. So uh, point very well taken and I think these are very basic things but as a chest physician we need to have these kind of practices so that it will definitely enhance you. Basics, I think basics won't change and we have to keep those uh, basics right. Uh, moving ahead, we have then Dr. Sridevi, one question for you. Uh, recently, I had one patient, he had a big lump in his uh, neck and then uh, he had gone to one uh, ENT surgeon in the past and then um, uh, they did uh, uh, operate you, then the node was taken out, the node was uh, uh, sent for only histopathology and the patient was put on anti-tuberculosis drugs. He came back after six months and then he came to me for the first time. He had a big lump and it was almost looking like an abscess. So what do you do? I mean, you do you do FNAC for these patients in your OPD or maybe in your small setup where you can send immediately for all kind of possible tests or you feel that no, no, they should be directly sent to the histopathologist or to the department and ultrasound guided FNAC only should be done for these patients. So what do you do? Because this is again one more very important area of our practice. And if you don't catch hold of these opportunities, I think you are losing not only the patient, but you are losing faith in the patient. You are losing and you are just making the system more and more complicated. That's what I feel. So what is your take on this, Dr. Devi? Uh, yes, uh, like uh, I think like we all have been doing FNACs as a first uh, test. I think like, you know, I think all of you will agree with me and uh, me as well. I think I would 
always go in for FNAC in any patient having neck nodes. That will be the first uh, test, I think, which we all should be doing. Uh, because like biopsy, like, you know, it can leave a lot of like big scars uh, post-surgery, especially in young girls. And, you know, that may not go well with them. So FNAC has to be definitely tried before uh, subjecting any patient for a more invasive and more expensive biopsy test. And it can give us like very crucial information. I think we have diagnosed uh, so many patients with FNAC itself and uh, like you know the um, uh, diagnostic rate uh, for the FNAC in uh, patients with tuberculosis is as high as more than 90 percent so I think like you know this has to be definitely tried and in some cases like you know it also helps us to rule out the malignancy as well uh, but uh, again, like, you know, you can do it under guidance or if at all the node is quite big, you can just go in for a direct FNAC as well. Uh, but it can also come with uh, uh, certain challenges, like, you know, if there's any uh, big vessel close to it, you'll be, uh, the chances of hitting the vessel and a lot of bleeding uh, risks uh, is a possibility. And sometimes, like, because the FNAC procedure itself can distort the cells and uh, we can get a false uh, positive report for malignancy, things like that. Or uh, sometimes there can be false negatives as well. And if the sample size is too less, then uh, I think like we get inconclusive re reports. In such cases, again, like, you know, we may have to subject the patient for uh, full uh, bi biopsy itself. But uh, definitely, I think FNAC should be the first test before we go in for biopsy. That is what would I, I would like to say. Definitely, 100%. And what I would like to add is, if you are doing FNAC, you should be able to fix the smear you and then only otherwise it is of no use. Unless you have those kind of equipments with you, don't dare to put a needle inside. Okay, because our basic aim is not to do the FNAC, but our basic aim is to get a diagnosis. Okay, so if you have those kind of techniques available with you, where you can at least stain the slide or you can fix the slide, you have an alcohol jar and then somebody from the clinic or maybe the patient's relative they can immediately transfer it to the pathologist. So that can definitely save a lot of time, a lot of money of the patient. Sometimes, you know, you get a patient who has a draining sinus and you don't know what to, what to do with the draining sinus. But if you just have a cultural tube and a swab stick available with you, you just take a swab from there, put it in the culture tube and send it for gene expert, Heinz test and TB culture. You are saving so much of time, you are saving so much of energy of the patient, money of the patient, and plus the patient is going to be compliant with the treatment is going to come back to you only. So, you know, these small, small things, but they can definitely enhance your practice a lot. So we are coming to the end of the talk and I think we are all here almost for more than one and a half hour. We have already overshoot the time, but uh, uh, nothing goes complete without having a good team. And... Uh, I feel in chess practice, the most important armamentarium, what if you ask me, is to have a good team. Just like Dr. Mishra also said, so Dr. Sridevi said that we need to have anesthetists, we need to have a good technician. So same way, I think in our OPD practice, as our OPD practice evolves and chess practice is more of OPD practice. If you want to take it from me, that 80% of our practice and 80% of pulmonologists if they believe and if they concentrate more and more on the diagnostic part and the OPD practice, I think we will be able to have a very good results. Plus, we'll be have, able to have a very good life. We'll be able to have a very good work-life balance. And for that, you need to have a good team. So in your team in the OPD, suppose if you have a phlebotomist with you and you have a very good laboratory with you where you have a patient of ILD, you want to do ANA blood test, but you don't know from where the reliable test is done. But you have a phlebotomist who is collecting the sample there and there itself in your clinic. And from there, the report goes to that particular lab. And then the reliable report comes to you. It can change your diagnosis. You know that this is not IPF, this is CTD ILD. So something like this. So if you have a phlebotomist, if you have a good PFT technician, he does 50% of your job of even using this asthma control questionnaire to do the CAT scoring. Plus, if you have a sister who can run your vaccination center, she can do flu and pneumonia vaccine and then your OPD can convert to an adult vaccination center. So you have a physiotherapist with you. She is able to do a six-minute walk test, plus she is able to guide your patients to do physiotherapy and then convert these patients into pulmonary rehab program. So, Dr. Ajay, being a senior person, what do you feel that? you feel that these all people should be there in your team in your OPD so that you will be able to give better services and you will be able to establish yourself as a very successful chase physician. What's your take on this? Yeah, it's a very tricky question, Dr. Mahavir. 
uh, it all depends on uh, what is your setup. Is it in a government setup? Is it is a private setup? Is it a corporate, or is it a uh, combined? You know, teamwork of uh, five or more doctors having you know one big uh, hospital where you have got your own IPD and all that. So I think it all depends on that. If you have uh, luxury, then uh, because you know uh, a single a person who is having the, uh, his own clinic and um, and and uh, doesn't have many resources, then he will find it very difficult. But then in the whole building, you will definitely have open pathologist who can be easily accessible. So I feel that it is a luxury to all have and to, you know, we'll be able to pay all of them. But if you are there nearby and they are, they know what time and, you know, what are the things to be done, then that, that will be as if as a add-on services. And that that is not a must, but uh, I mean, I feel PFT technician is a must. Uh, a person who is like, as uh, somebody was saying, I don't remember that we don't, I think Dr. Sadipa, uh, Sadip was saying, Dr. Mishra was saying that we don't have a trained person to help us in bronchoscopy. Uh, let me tell you that in uh, Central India, uh, there are a center like the hospital medical college where I was working. We used to have 10 students which were doing BSc, respiratory therapy is a course of three-year course where uh, they are trained in a uh, lot of things. And the basic are uh, were PFT do, doing PFT and as a helping hand next to the nurse or somebody to take care of your bronchoscope to you know to manage pre-op care and to manage all the samples. So we had, I mean, I think at, at very a, a various center in India they are now developing and so that is a must. But then these are ancillary, so you may get away uh, without them, but you should have access to them. Yes. Huh? Thank you very much. I think that was an excellent answer that it all depends upon kind of practice where you are. But I differ slightly. I feel that this is something which is not difficult. This is something which is easily available. To build a team is something which is very, very important yes. and uh, yes. that can help all of us for uh, building a better practice and uh, to establish yourself as a successful case physician. It will save a lot of your time, a lot of your energy because, uh, you know, and it is friendly for the patient also. Even they want something where everything is available under one roof and uh, they come to you and they get a complete picture about their case disease. You know, from the diagnosis up to the treatment, they are very, very happy instead of going to 10 places. So I think it's need of our maybe two or three people coming together and then setting up these kind of setups. So that also can uh, definitely serve the purpose. So I think this is the, this was the last question and because we are uh, short of time, but um, I would like to thank every one of you for excellent uh, answers and to the point answers. So uh, only one takeaway from everyone that if you want to take one armamentarium, which you are not doing in your clinical practice up till now, but after this today's webinar, if you want to implement one such armamentarium, what it will be? I will start with Dr. Madhur. So, and then one by one, uh, muted. So thank you, sir, for the question. Uh, so I think uh, the, the one thing I would like to take from here is that uh, I and I would suggest everybody should follow this, that we should use a Brahms needle for closed plural biopsies. You know, it's a very handy tool. Uh, I am also doing uh, medical thoracoscopies. Uh, but at times when I decide that on table, I don't, I could not, the fluid is not enough to go in with a, a rigid thoracoscope. Uh, I definitely take a closed pleural biopsy. So that is the one thing I think which everyone should have. And it is not at all an expensive tool. Abraham's needle is very easily available. It's a stainless steel tube. You just need to, uh, you know, develop your uh, skill in that. Dr. Uh I, I think I would like to take home uh, POCUS, a uh, point of care ultrasound, because it has so many advantages. And I think this is going to be the future and game changer and uh, saving lives and saving time. I think uh, this is what I would like to take. Dr. Saumya? Uh, yeah, I would like to take uh, Abram Steedle after all this discussion. So uh, probably um, I feel like we are utilizing the resources like Abraham Steedle, very less compared to other things which in our daily routine practice. That uh, that is beneficial to the patients as well. And we also uh, we can uh, we use the uh, most valuable resource to give the diagnosis. Yeah. Dr. Mishra. 
Uh, two things. Uh, one is uh, when we started, uh, Sir told a very good thing about uh, the touch. Uh, so more of uh, clinical touch and touching the patient, examining the patient and palpating and uh, knowing the pulse on our own rather than depending on the pulse oximeter. And the second one would be the asthma COPD questionnaire to assess the patient. These two are the things I would like to implement more and more in my practice. Absolutely. Dr. Ajay? Yeah, thank you so much. In fact, uh, I have two things to say. One is I have, I will take a message and I will give a message. So one take home message uh, which I am getting is a portable uh, PF, you know, spirometer. So that is what I feel that it was. I, I used to do it, but I stopped. Uh, I think that's that will be a very big game changer because mm -hmm. not every person, you know, I'll be sending them immediately. And I get the idea immediately as, uh, you know, on that table. Maybe in day to day round also and maybe for some ICU patient. And one takeaway message which I like to give at the last, uh, I'm sorry I'm entering into time, but uh, a good uh, communication while we are talking to the patient. We are talking, we should talk less and listen to listen more. Uh, although it's a very difficult task, I'm still way far away from this skill, but uh, at time it gives me a lot of reason. I just stop and I just look to the patient, just talk here and there and patient says, oh, this is the clue. Uh, we have a history of exposure to dog. Oh, this lung lesion a heritage cyst. Nothing else. So I think that uh, is a carry-on message I'd like to give. But thanks a lot. Dr. Mahavir, you have uh, excellently, uh, thanks to you, uh, I know you were awake uh, for like a couple of nights and you have been thinking and you framed this question and made all our panelists' life a wonderful one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And... Uh... Uh, we can close the session. If uh, are there any live questions from anyone? I think we have answered most of the questions. And because as I said that this topic can be endless, and uh, each whatever we had these small small subsegments, each question it could have been a topic by itself. But still, uh, our panelists were expert and they could give the time framed answer. So thank you everyone again uh, for keeping it to the point and thank you CCR for giving us this platform and this unique opportunity to share the diets and share our concepts. And if one takeaway message you, I would like to have from this particular age, that is, I would like to have all of you to build a team and to have a better practice. Thank you everyone once again and uh, uh, good night. Can thank you, sir. Good night. Yes. Yeah.